Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromycel technology. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. Welcome back to part two of my interview with Dr. Abraham Morgenteller. In this episode, Dr. Morgenteller answers questions about testosterone and hair loss. He also dives deeper into the relationship between testosterone and prostate cancer. If you're new here and you like our interviews, press like, subscribe, share, and hit the bell. Also, please leave comments. Be sure to watch our full-length documentary, Open Your Eyes, on Amazon Prime, Apple TV, iTunes, Google Play, and YouTube Movies and Shows. And tune in to our brand new radio show, Saturday mornings at 9 a.m. Central Time on AM 1280, The Patriot. I just want to just review the purpose of testosterone for men and the purpose of testosterone for women. If you could just review what that is. Sure. So testosterone therapy, I, well, so listen, so we have testosterone. Oh, just, just testosterone, why the body makes it, yes. Yeah. So testosterone um, has, uh, most hormones work through what are called receptors. So the testosterone goes to um, a muscle cell or a, a kidney cell or a brain cell. And um, it doesn't work by itself. It has to bind within that cell to something called a receptor. This is true for, for most of hormone actions. And, um, and once that receptor is bound to what it needs, in, in this case, a testosterone molecule, then together they go to the nucleus of the cell and where they change whatever proteins or whatever it is that that cell has to do. Test androgen receptors, receptors for testosterone are in almost all tissue. They're in the brain, they're in peripheral nerves, they're in muscle, they're in fat, they're in kidney, they're in um, liver, uh, they're in bone, they're in, um, you name it, testosterone is, is there. And it's a primary, it's one of the most important hormones, one of the most important chemicals in our bodies. And when people are deficient in it, all those different areas, all those different tissues are affected by it some more than others. So I talked about sperm. If, if guys have low levels of testosterone, they may not make sperm properly. Muscles needed to sort of, the reason men have tend to have bigger muscles and more definition of their muscles than women is because we have more testosterone. Women bodybuilders take testosterone and they can get just as defined and big as some of the guys. Um, it affects our fat. Um, it helps keep fat down. Um, and it affects our brain and our peripheral ner and our nerves that go to different areas. You know, there's an interesting thing. I know you're an op optometrist by training. Um, most people don't know this, but, but testosterone deficiency is associated with dry eyes. Dry eyes is one of the most common reasons that people go to an eye doctor. Um, and it can be very irritating. Um, and it turns out that, um, uh, that some of these people have been treated 
with you have to get it compounded like eye ointment that includes testosterone or or, or drops and it can help with dry eyes um uh, we had, uh, you know, so one of the things I'm most proud of is, is I helped to create what's called the Ant Society. It's an org professional organization that focuses on testosterone issues. And it's been in existence for about five or six years now. And about two or three years ago, we had uh, Dr. David Sullivan, who was at the time from the Massachusetts Eye and Ear uh, Institute, one of the foremost research organizations and clinical areas. Uh, in the country dealing with this. And he spoke specifically about the research around testosterone, the eye, and in particular, dry eyes. Um, and it's just impressive. Like the number of things that are affected by testosterone deficiency is just astonishing and helped by normalizing. Now, let me ask you about estrogen. I mean, this aromatase testosterone turns into estrogen. And the estradiol is also important for sexual function. So is that something that you test and you monitor if estrogen is too high, of men are converting too much to estrogen or too much to estradiol, or if it's too low, they're not, they, don't, they're not, they don't have enough aromatase and not converting enough. So when you're doing the labs, are you looking at estradiol and how is, important is that? So um, the estradiol story is a little um, confusing. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I, I think that the final, there's some things about testosterone that for me at this point, that I think the data support is like clear cut. With estradiol, it's a little bit less clear cut and it, the value of testing it, um, I think there is some value in it, but um, it's really uh, important maybe around the edges rather than uh, the middle. So testosterone and estradiol are, are actually, and estradiol is the primary estrogen, but not the only one. And they're very closely connected chemically. So there's an enzyme that converts testosterone to estradiol. And it's just one chemical change in, in this uh, larger molecule. And, um, but their actions are very different. So we talked about receptors a minute ago. There's a receptor for testosterone, really called the androgen receptor. And there are receptors for estrogens called the estrogen receptor. You make that one little switch and testosterone will not bind to the estrogen receptor. Estrogen will not bind to the testosterone receptor. And they do different things. People have wondered for a long time about what estrogen does in men. So, you know, what's, and, and, and some of the best data came from a brilliant study uh, done by um, uh, a guy named Finkelstein at, at Mass General Hospital in Boston, published in New England Journal of Medicine probably about eight years ago, 10 years ago. And what he did is he gave medicine that lowered testosterone in men. So they weren't producing any of their own. And then he gave them back testosterone at different doses, trying to see if there's like a threshold for different things that happen at different levels. And what he also did is you can give a medicine called an aromatase inhibitor that blocks the conversion of testosterone to estradiol. So normally when we treat somebody with testosterone, estradiol also goes up because there's more testosterone, that enzyme takes more of the stuff and converts more of it to estradiol. So every man who goes on testosterone gets a bump in their estradiol. With that medicine that blocks that conversion in half the men, what he had was a population of men who had good levels of testosterone now but almost no estradiol. And he could compare what was what. And so it turned out that estradiol is important for men for a few things. One is it's involved with libido, sex drive. Who knew? We think of estradiol, like simplistically, we say testosterone is the male hormone, estradiol is the female hormone. It's not so. It's not so in women. It's not so in men. Women need testosterone to feel optimal. Men need estradiol for certain things to be optimal too. It was important for sex drive. And also, this is amazing. So testosterone, we know, increases muscle, but also decreases fat. So often when men have low levels of testosterone, one of their complaints is, I've gained fat, especially around the belly. I don't know why. I'm really careful. I'm working out. And that's because their testosterone uh, isn't doing what it needs to do. Um, 
it turns out that the ability to lose fat requires estradiol. So some of the actions of testosterone in the body are by testosterone itself as it circulates, and some of it is by its conversion to estradiol as it circulates. Now, some of the docs that are really into testosterone, especially sort of from the anti-aging community, are very uh, strongly feel that estra high, too, level, too high levels of estradiol are dangerous for men. Um, I'm not sure that the data really support that. The one thing that we see with higher levels of estradiol in some cases is that men can get some uh, swelling of their breast tissue, which we call gynecomastia. And we can treat that by giving the blocker of aromatase, the aromatase inhibitor, and then they don't have as much estrogen, their breast tissue goes down and they're happier. There are data from what we call population studies, where they look at large numbers of people from uh, an area like Alabama or in specific places, San Bernardino, California. It's had a lot of studies. You may have heard of the Framingham study where they've done a lot of uh, stuff. And, you know, they followed some of these populations for decades. And it turns out that if you have higher levels of estradiol, the group with the highest levels have more heart disease and more deaths. The que and, and that's part of the justification for saying we need to be careful to not let estradiol get too high. And those doctors will usually treat every man with testosterone will also add an aromatase inhibitor. The most common drug is called anastrozole or, or arimidex. Um, and, um, but I don't think it's a fair comparison. So men who are on testosterone who get a higher estradiol are not the same as people who have a naturally occurring high level of estradiol. Who has high levels of estradiol naturally? Frankly, people who are overweight and obese. So fat tissue has a lot of that enzyme aromatase that converts testosterone to uh, estradiol. And, and even though in most studies, they do what they call uh, adjustment for obesity or BMI, you know, body mass index, those kinds of statistical adjustments you can never be certain that it's done everything it's supposed to do. And the term that's used in statistics is residual confounding. You can think that you took care of it statistically by manipulating the data, but you didn't necessarily. And I just think that they're different situations. So I do not routinely give uh, an aromatase inhibitor when I start testosterone, but I do monitor the estradiol. And in some cases, if I think it's indicated, I'll, I'll give a, a block. But I don't think we need to do it uh, routinely. And there's a downside also, which is that when estradiol is too low, too low, you may not see the full benefits of testosterone, number one. And number two is men are at risk for osteoporosis because estradiol is, is a powerful promoter of bone um, density and bone growth where you need it. Now, we talked about sex hormone binding globule before. Is there a way to prevent it from getting too high to give more free testosterone, maybe any natural ways of doing it? Foods, or is it just really being overweight and exercising to help it? Yeah, so that, you know, there's been a lot of interest in that and, and um, uh, you know, sort of in the, in the nutritional and sort of... Um, age management communities, there are a couple of supplements that have been recommended uh, to try and lower SHBG. Um, but I'm not aware of any data that they actually are effective. Uh, my own feeling about it is that SHBG isn't necessarily doing anything bad. <laughs> it just is making it harder to interpret total testosterone value. So as long as you know what, you know, so as long as you have a free testosterone, you're okay. So somebody can have a sky high SHBG concentration. If you give testosterone, the free testosterone is going to go up. Total will too, but they're both going to go up. And I don't really see it as much of a problem. And how about giving testosterone related to baldness? 
How is baldness and testosterone related? I've seen actually some studies that low testosterone could actually cause baldness. So is there, do we really know about this? I, I, I think we do, but, um, um, but there's also confusion about this. So here's the story is that um, male pattern hair loss has not been shown in, in any of the multiple studies where testosterone goes against the placebo. In other words, there, there's not one study that I'm aware of, and I've spent my life looking at testosterone studies, where you know the author said, and we saw this very high incidence of male pattern hair loss. Doesn't happen. What does happen is that hair loss is really common in men, super common, right, as we get older. And even guys who get to keep their hair into their 60s and 70s, it's not the same density as it was before. It's largely genetically determined. The reason people have worried about testosterone is that you need to have, is that by, is that testosterone is implicated in this way. You need to have a certain amount of testosterone to get what we call male pattern hair loss. So historically, um, eunuchs, men who had their testicles removed or um, for all sorts of reasons, it was observed they didn't lose their hair as they got older. Women, by and large, women have, a, there's some women, unfortunately, can get hair loss too, but obviously it's not at the same frequency as men. It's much, much less common. And women have much less testosterone. Some of the women that get hair loss uh, have polycystic ovary disease where they tend to have higher levels of testosterone. And so that's the original set of observations that did it. And, and what's clear is that there's a part of our head where most of the hair loss happens in the male pattern stuff that is dependent on having testosterone in the system. And it's not testosterone so much that's important, but uh, um, a metabolite of it called dihydrotestosterone, or we call it DHT. And so the, drug, the most common drug that helps with hair loss in men is called finasteride or Propecia is its trade name, and it blocks the conversion of testosterone to DHT. And a lot of those men get either stable, their hair loss gets stabilized, or they may have regrowth of it. And it's sort of like having castrate levels of the important uh, androgen in, in the scalp, which is DHT. It's not a testosterone action, it's an action of DHT. So people say, well, if you get more uh, testosterone, you're going to get more DHT. DHT is what helps promote the hair loss, uh, but the studies don't show that. And the explanation is that once you have a certain amount of testosterone in your system, which will give you a certain amount of DHT, whatever happens from that point onwards is genetically determined. And is that why young people don't, get hair loss, even though they have more testosterone, because maybe the genetics haven't kicked in yet? Well, that's exactly right. I mean, there are, fa there are families where, you know, the, the males often will, will start losing their hair and become bald in their 20s. And there are other families where everybody seems to keep their hair. I'm not a hair loss specialist, but, you know, a lot of this goes along sort of skips generations and stuff like that, but it's genetically determined. So you need, if you're a male and you have a certain amount of testosterone, you probably have enough for hair loss to occur. I had one, but I, you know, listen, I've had, uh, I've had a couple of patients who, and I've, I've treated thousands of men over the years. Um, I've only had a few instances, only a few where um, somebody called me up and said, Hey, I'm, I'm starting to lose my hair. One of them was a colleague, <laughs> um, a colleague and a friend a prominent individual in the Boston medical community. And I said, geez, that's unusual. He says, he says, Abe, you started me on that testosterone. I'm losing my hair. And I said, geez, that's so unusual. And he ended up seeing a dermatologist and he didn't have male pattern hair loss. He had a patchy hair loss, which is a different thing, often related to stress, but often unknown what, what it does. And, you know, six months later, his hair had regrown and, and it was fine. And then I've had other people who, not many, but some who said, you know, I'm starting to lose my hair and I just started testosterone not that long ago. It's got to be related. Um, 
but you know, it's a lot of people when they start losing their hair, there's a point at which they notice <laughs> that it's really changing for them. It's been going on for years, but until you get below a certain density of hair follicles, you don't really notice it. And just by chance, that's going to happen to some people after, after they start anything. You brought up Propecia, Finasteride. Some men, and that's made from progesterone. Some men, men actually have a lower sex drive and have trouble with erections secondary to finasteride. I hope and, you don't mind it. I hope you don't mind that oh, my no. cat wants to come in here. We, he's, he's been meowing, so it's easier to, to keep yeah, obviously you have, Yeah, <laughs> obviously he has a lot of hair, so we don't have to worry about <laughs> as much. Um, so uh, progesterone, we don't know. We, I don't know what to do with progesterone. Um, you know, over, over the course of my career, uh, I've uh, tested and looked at and analyzed um, everything I could think of, including progesterone and certainly estradiol. And, uh, you know, we've had people who the lab showed that they were deficient in progesterone. And we tried to get it back to them. And I was underwhelmed with the responses. So is it important for men? Uh, maybe, but I'm but does, not. I but don't does know. it cause uh, ED and uh, erectile dysfunction by taking finasteride? Can it be a side effect? Have you seen it? Oh, I'm sorry. I, I heard you say progesterone, not finasteride. My yeah, mistake. Because, yeah, I mean, it's a two part question because they make it from, right? Finasteride is made from progesterone. Oh, I see. Men yeah. I'll give them progesterone to sleep better at night. And is it, you know, because I've, I've actually, believe it or not, even though I'm an eye doctor, I've had patients tell me they're taking the finasteride and they're having erectile dysfunction. I don't know what they're telling an eye doctor, but they, you know, they'll tell you about all their health problems. Sure. And I was just wondering how common you think that is. So it's it's fairly common. So um, you know, finasteride came out, I think, the 1980s uh, as a drug for prostate. So there are some tissues in the body that, that are more responsive to DHT than to T, testosterone. And one of them is the scalp in, in terms of hair, and the other is the prostate. And so it turned out that they discovered that when they gave finasteride to men, the prostates got smaller and some of the urination symptoms that men have as they get older improved, shrinks the prostate by about a third. And um, Merck was the manufacturer and brought it to market. And there were a certain uh, percentage of uh, men who had, had adverse effects, including sexual ones, lost their libido, erection problems. The numbers were fairly small, like on the order of two to 3%. It turns out it's not that rare though. And so, and the effect can be delayed sometimes for years. So. If I see a guy who's got erection problems and he's on finasteride for whatever reason, hair or prostate, I'll usually tell him to stop, take a vacation from it, take a holiday from the medicine and see if things improve. And sometimes it does and it's marvelous. And in which case it was clearly that medication that did. In some cases it's not. The scary thing is that there now is pretty clear that there is a, a small but real percentage of men who take those medications and they get a number of side effects, not just sexual, but they just feel lousy. And they never improve even when they stop the medicine. Mm. And it's, it's called post-finasteride syndrome. There's another drug called dutasteride that works similarly to finasteride. It can happen with that too. And so I'm, you know, when I treat men with uh, who have sexual issues, I tend to be a little... Uh, cautious and hesitant to give them finasteride for other reasons. Um, but listen, a lot of it's being used and the vast majority of men will do fine with it, but it is a risk. The All Eyes Visual Hall VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. MacuHealth, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. Before we go on to the cancer and heart disease and stroke, I do want to, you mentioned the different types of 
uh, testosterone therapies, the, the gels, the injection. There's actually now pills that don't cause liver problems. Uh, there's pellets, uh, patches, uh, trochies. What do you think is the best and the easiest way for a man to take testosterone? Say, for example, you were going to do it, for an example, which one would you do? And which do you think your men do the best with? Which type of replacement? So I get that question a lot. And the answer is, is that um, uh, as long as we get testosterone up to good levels, it almost doesn't matter how people get there. Um, you know, as long as it's sustained and often the choices come down to um, convenience and uh, appeal or lack of appeal for the individual. What do I mean by that? So, you know, when the gels for, so the injections of testosterone, cypionate, testosterone, and anthate have been around since the 1950s. And for a long time, that was the only way we gave testosterone. The gels came out, I think Andrew Gel was the first came out, I believe in 2001. And there was a lot of enthusiasm for it. And for quite a few years, gels or what we call topicals on the skin became the number one form of treatment. Um, and they work. Um, you know, there are a certain number of men, maybe as high as 15% who don't absorb it well through the skin and we go on to something else. Pellets were actually, believe it or not, one of the first. And what pellets are, it looks like a grain of rice. And you can they come in different sizes with different doses. Uh, and usually they're placed under the skin, usually in the buttock area, but they could be placed elsewhere. And believe it or not, when testosterone first became available in the 1930s, pellets were one of the first treatments. But the first FDA approved pellet happened in the 1970s. And almost nobody knew about it because it wasn't marketed. And then uh, in the late 2000s, um, it sort of became uh, a new company came came on and became better known. And now a lot of men get treated either with FDA, the FDA approved pellet, or there are a lot of compounding pharmacies that make pellets um, and the doctors can use those. Um, and then, you know, we also had oral testosterone going back really to the 30s also, uh, and then variations in the uh, 50s. So testosterone is a pill. If you take pure testosterone, the body breaks it down almost instantly. And it's got what we call a very short half-life. It's not useful. And so to make it last longer in the body, they put on a little side chain onto it. And it's called alkylated or methylated. And, um, and that keeps it around. And some form of those are still available, but they were found to cause liver damage. So they're absorbed through the gut, high concentration went to the liver. There's some serious liver uh, issues that were described with that. And so for the most part, we've avoided using orals for 30 plus years. And then over the last, I think, two or three years came the first new orals. And they're called, it's called testosterone undecanoate. It's got this long carbon side chain. It is not absorbed through the gut in the normal places. Rather, it's absorbed through the lymphatic system. And it doesn't cause the liver trouble that we used to have. And they're, they're good, great levels, um, but they only last several hours. So all of, there are three now that are FDA approved um, and you have to take them twice a day, often with food. So how do you make the right decision for people? Often when I'm seeing somebody and they just wanna see, they wanna know, is this gonna work for me? Injections are kind of easy. Everybody absorbs it. We get good levels. That's fine. And eventually people often, we teach them how to do their own injections, but not everybody wants to do injections. So some people rubbing a cream on every day, seems like a good idea for them. And if it works fine, other do people say, I'm not going to spend my time doing that. Do we have to worry about creams or if they touch somebody else in the family, a kid or whatever. Yeah, there's a, you know, we, we call it transference when, when the testosterone from your own body can go to a, a, a woman or a child who all of whom should have very low levels. You know, there are some rare cases that have been described of transference by and large um, is after you put it on, uh, you know, 20, 30 minutes later, uh, it's not much is on the surface anymore. Um, so I don't think of that as a big risk, but it is a black box warning for all the topicals. Um, and, um, but they listen, but they work. And the point is, 
that I tailor what's available to what the patient is interested in. And then cost comes in too. So a lot of the newer treatments can be very costly, even with insurance coverage. And, um, and then we play the game with insurance companies and, and, and all that. And if people want something that's inexpensive, you know, they may go back to the injections that have been around forever and are, you know, generic now. And, you know, you mentioned uh, testosterone where, and fertility. If somebody wants to raise their per, uh, testosterone but keep their fertility, there's something like Clomid, but they don't help. It doesn't help as much with the symptoms. Am, am I correct on that? Yeah, that's right. I, there's, a, there's a listen. You've been you've been marvelous in this interview, and you've clearly done your homework. Um, uh, you've got a highly evolved uh, understanding uh, of this issue. So there are doctors. So Clomid is a pill. It's been around for a long time. It's used in women. Um, it does not have an indication for any use in men, but it's been used in the infertility world for male infertility for forty years. Um, and I used it for men with infertility, where it can help in a percentage of cases with sperm counts. Uh, I've used it for, for decades. And what, what people noticed was it also raised testosterone in men. But the problem is, is that it interferes with the estrogenic effect. It's an anti-estrogen. And there are a lot of men who take Clomid, and they may say they feel a little bit better, but, it's re but their testosterone may look fabulous but they don't notice that much. There's some who think that it's a solid effect. And I, I do have some men who are on Clomid, but by and large, uh, Clomid is not a, a first line treatment in, in my practice. And that brought us back to the Finkelstein effect about the estrogen. Uh, exactly. HCG, uh, that also could raise testosterone. What's the benefits of that? Are there any benefits of HCG over taking testosterone? Yeah. So listen, I, I think there's two areas that still have been under uh, underdeveloped. Uh, if I just go back to orals for a second, the pills, um, there's been very little uptake of using the pills in this country so far. And a, a lot of the issue has been cost and, in, and lack of insurance coverage. I think that there's a new one of the, the newer ones. Uh, it's called Kaisatrex. Um, and for disclosure, I've done some consulting for them, but they've lowered their price to make it affordable. And I think a lot of people would like to take a pill. It's so easy. Uh, the levels are good. You have to do it twice a day. We're but Americans. That, uh, what, what's that? We're Americans. We like ease. Yeah, of course. And, and that's how we take most of our medicines is by pill. So I just want to put that out there. And uh, that's a relatively new product. So that's interesting. Um, HCG is something I've been working on for a long time. HCG is an injection. It stands for human chorionic gonadotropin. It's been used uh, and has an FDA approved indication in men for fertility. And so what it does is it mimics luteinizing hormone, which is the signal from the brain to the testicle. And it tells the testicle make more testosterone. The reason we use the infertility is remember that the sperm cells that are developing need high levels of testosterone in the testicle. And so HCG turns on the testosterone producing factory in the testicle. It's good in many cases for sperm, but it turns out that the men also benefit from having a higher uh, testosterone level. So it works only in men who still have the capacity in their testicles to turn up the production. There's some men have bad testicles for one reason or another, it won't work in them. And, um, but the, it's limiting thing is that it's an injection and it's got a relatively short half-life, which means you have to, most guys were treating them three times a week. So you have to teach the guys to do that. So they're giving themselves a shot three times a week. Uh, some, over the last few years, it's been uh, harder <laughs> to get HCG. It's a lot of injections for people who aren't that excited about doing injections. Uh, it can be costly, uh, but it's a very good treatment. And in some ways is as natural a treatment as you're gonna get, because it's the body's own testosterone that's being produced. Any significant side effects from your experience? You know, there's there's um, some anecdotal evidence that uh, more men get some of the breast tenderness and swelling than they do with testosterone alone. I happen to think that's likely to be true, but it's not a common thing that we see. And again, it's treatable. 
Now let's get into the, what you're really famous for is testosterone replacement. And let's talk about prostate cancer. About 50% of men have some over age 50, from my understanding, uh, that they have some micro foci of actual prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is probably more common than we think. So, and there was a study done uh, by Pastor, Pastor Zarek in 2013, where he had people with high Gleason scores that he gave testosterone and they, it act, that it already had prostate cancer, I believe, and it actually lowered the recurrence. Now, can you clarify that? Am I saying it right? Exactly what did he find? Yeah. So Alex Pastushak uh, was at Baylor at the time and his colleagues at, the, at Baylor College of Medicine uh, in the urology group there, uh, Larry Lipschultz and Mo Kira, um, they took men, it was what we call a retrospective study. Um, and what they did is that they looked at men who uh, had undergone radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer and uh, had received testosterone therapy. Uh, that group, um, together probably with our center, uh, has probably the most experience in the country in treating men with prostate cancer with testosterone. And they started early with it, uh, to their credit. And they published a lot of really good and important information. So they took, they looked at their group of men who'd had radical prostate surgery for cancer and who had received testosterone. Some of those men had aggressive cancers and were what they called a high risk group. There was another group that a comparison group of men who'd had the same surgery, um, uh, but had never received testosterone. And when they looked at how many of the men had a recurrence of their cancer at some point in the, down the line, the men who received testosterone had a lower rate of recurrence, cancer recurrence than the men who had never gotten testosterone, even though a substantial percentage of their patients, I forget the exact number, 20% or something, had very high risk cancers. If, the, if I remember the numbers right, it was 4% in the testosterone group, and I believe it was 8% in the other group. And now that's a provocative study because it's been the belief that if you raise testosterone, it's like pouring gasoline on a fire people who are at high risk for a recurrence because they've got more aggressive cancer or things, uh, maybe the margins of the specimen still had some cancer at the edge. It, 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 it's been thought that if you had, gave testosterone to those people, that those cancer cells would divide like crazy and show up. And that's not what happened. Subsequent to that study, there's been a larger one with about 500 patients. I think that one that we talked about had on the order of 120. Um, and this was published at University of California at Irvine, and the lead author is a, a fellow named Tom Allering, A-H-L-E-R-I-N-G. And he also gives testosterone to, he, so he has a very busy practice doing radical prostatectomy, robotic surgery for cancer. And he also will give testosterone to the men who feel like uh, they need it. And in their group, if you got testosterone, that was an independent predictor that you would not get a recurrence of cancer. Receiving testosterone had a lower rate of, of cancer recurrence than men who didn't get it. And it's sort of, it's hard, you know, I, there's a reason people say, well, why don't you have a randomized controlled study? Cause that's been our gold standard, how we do things, right? You get a group of people, they're gonna get a treatment, let's say radical prostatectomy. And then you can say ahead of time, we're going to give, with your consent, we're going to give half of you testosterone, half of you not. And the reason we don't have those studies is that until the last several years, it's been considered unethical to give testosterone to men with prostate cancer because people were so certain it was bad for prostate cancer. It turns out that all these data that we have, and, and there's literally a couple of dozen studies, fail to show that that's true. On the contrary, we're now seeing evidence that having the, the receiving testosterone with a history of prostate cancer may actually be favorable for you, may be beneficial for you. Amazing. So, this, so there's all these different categories with prostate cancer. When you talk radical, does that mean that the whole prostate has been taken out? 
That's right. So where would the recurrence of cancer come from then? It wouldn't be in the prostate. It would be another, can another type of cancer. So usually it's in the lymph nodes that are nearby the, nearby the prostate and the pelvis. Okay, that makes sense. Now, people that have watchful waiting, so, so they'll, have pro, they'll say they have prostate cancer, but they don't feel that you should do any kind of treatment, watchful waiting. Taking testosterone, the studies from Loeb and others show that taking testosterone doesn't make it any worse. Is that correct? Yeah, I, so I think I published the first paper on, on what we call active surveillance. So there's some men who have uh, are diagnosed with prostate cancer, but the cancer appears to be uh, less aggressive. And uh, in a lot of those guys, we say, you know, the risk of this causing trouble for you uh, is low. Um, and uh, we're just keep going to keep a close eye on you. And usually we do follow-up biopsies um, to make sure that things aren't getting worse. And I had, you know, so I, I started, you know, I had all these men with testosterone and the risk of prostate cancer wasn't showing up the way that I thought it should be. I started publishing papers using other data that showed that, you know, that in fact, low testosterone appeared to be a risk for prostate cancer, aggressive prostate cancer, not high testosterone. And, um, and I, I was sort of on the lecture circuit within urology and the prostate cancer world. And an 84-year-old gentleman came to see me, uh, totally with it. He's a former attorney, um, and uh, and he he said he was married and things weren't going right for him sexually, and so we measured his testosterone level and it was low. And I told him, you know, I think there's a good chance that you know testosterone could help you, but his PSA was high, and he hadn't had a PSA before. And I said to him. Um, you know, I don't, at 84, I don't do a lot of prostate biopsies in men your age, because usually even if you have prostate cancer, it's going to take 10 plus years to cause trouble for you. So at 84, I don't do a lot of biopsies. But I said, but yours is pretty high and you might want to know whether or not you've got an aggressive cancer or not. And he said, I want to do the biopsy. And his biopsy came back and he had prostate cancer, but a low grade one, one that's unlikely to cause him trouble. And he said to me uh, after discussion about his cancer, he said, I, I don't want you to treat me. I just want you to watch it. And I agreed with that. I said, I think that's a good decision. We'll do that. And I was ready to leave the exam room. And he says, but doctor, what about my testosterone? And I said, well, you've got prostate cancer. I've never treated anybody like you who you've got prostate cancer that we're not even going to treat. So, you know, the theory is it could make your cancer grow rapidly and he said and he was very smart logical and he says doctor if you give me testosterone and my cancer grows won't my psa go up and i said probably it's logical that would happen but i don't know because i've never treated anybody like you he said and if it went up because the cancer grew and we stopped the testosterone wouldn't my psa go back down again i say that's also logical but I don't know because I've never treated anybody like you. He said, I'd like to try it. He says, uh, I'm 84. And um, I'm willing to take the risk. I'm an attorney. I, I'll, I'll sign any document you want that I accept all the risks. You know, what's important to me at, at this point in my life is quality. Quality of life, not quantity. So I'll do it. And I'd like you to treat me. And he clearly understood the risks. And so I treated him. And what I published was two years of testosterone therapy. And I showed a graph of his PSA levels. So his PSA, PSA we use as an indicator of whether cancer is progressing or not. And his PSA stayed completely flat for two years. And at the end of two years, it actually started to come down a little bit. And that was the beginning of my experience treating men with untreated prostate cancer, with testosterone. And he was older, clearly. Uh, and he was on testosterone for six years. When he was 90, his wife, and he did well with it. He was happy. At 90, his wife brought him in and he had developed dementia. And we decided there was no point in his continuing on with testosterone, but prostate cancer was never an issue for him. But he gave me the courage to do this in younger men. 
And so we've published a couple of papers on men who are not being treated for their prostate cancer, are on what we call active surveillance, but are on testosterone. And, um, and nothing much has happened to them. And uh, we published the first paper, I believe, in 2011 in 13 men. And then in uh, all of whom had follow-up prostate biopsies, none of them had progression of their cancer. And uh, a few years later, we did a larger group um, where we compared their uh, progression rates to men who never got testosterone. And the rates were the same. You know, there's some people who are going to have their cancers progress, but it was the same in both groups, whether they got testosterone or not. And so today I'm convinced, absolutely 100% convinced that the story that testosterone drives prostate cancer, that it's a risk for men uh, if they take testosterone um, in terms of prostate cancer is absolutely false. And um, the challenge for some of your listeners and viewers is that the belief that it's a problem is still out there and is highly, uh, and it can be hard to get somebody to treat them if they've been diagnosed with prostate cancer. But more and more, I think the evidence is becoming clear to more doctors. And so hopefully that'll stop being a big issue uh, as we move forward. And how about with metastatic prostate cancer? Do you think it, it there's any, any difference by giving them these people, maybe they're, they're not very happy, they're, they're, they're miserable, they want some testosterone to make them feel better. Do you think that makes the, the metastatic cancer worse? Or do you think it help, could, help, could help it? Or you, we're not sure yet? There's very little information on this. At the, in the last several years, uh, um, I started seeing some of these men who came from all over who were desperate to go on testosterone, even though they had metastatic prostate cancer. Desperate. And almost all of them said, listen, I know I've got metastatic prostate cancer. I'm almost certainly going to die of it. But the life that I'm living now is not worth living for me. They were depressed or weak. Um, I had one guy who felt like he was too weak to wash his hair in the shower to get his arms up to do it. Standard treatment for men with metastatic disease is to lower their testosterone with what we call androgen deprivation, medicines that lower it. And there are some benefits to it in terms of um, survival and length of time without progression, but those are measured in months, not years the advantage. And some of those men, the quality of their lives is so impaired that these men came to me and basically pled with, begged me to treat them. And with a lot of, um, uh, <laughs> a lot of concerns on my part and ambivalence, I treated some of them. And uh, it was amazing to me that, that um, like they had, they did have metastatic prostate cancer and that that's a disease that's going to run its course. We don't have a cure for metastatic prostate cancer. Um, but the quality of their lives was just so much better. And um, so I, I, we wrote up about 20 of these guys uh, in a paper that was published in 2021. Um, there's not a lot of it. There's a couple of case reports of individual patients who got testosterone despite metastatic disease. Um, but the most interesting thing is not what I did, uh, although I sort of gave it sort of under regular conditions, guys come in with a problem, but there's a group that's really centered at Johns Hopkins in their oncology group, where they're now taking men with the worst prognosis from prostate cancer. They're all going to die within a relatively short period of time, uh, within a year often. And they give them testosterone. They raise their testosterone very high and then they drop it as a recurrent cycle every four weeks. They call it bipolar androgen therapy. And they call it bipolar because the testosterone goes super high, way above normal. They give them high dose and then it goes super low. And, and those men, many of those men have done remarkably well. So what we've done, what they've done is they flipped the old idea that any any hint, any whiff of testosterone is going to be bad for this prostate cancer. 
And they're now using it as part of their treatment protocol for men with some of the worst cancers. It's amazing. So that story is yet, uh, the conclusion of that story is yet to be written. Um, but I think that the clear picture that testosterone makes prostate cancer happen, which is how I started you know, with my journey all those years ago, cannot be true. And there's one, um, and I know we have to end shortly, but um, there's one uh, fact that, that people, and do including doctors, have to understand. Men get prostate cancer when we are older and our testosterone is low. We never get prostate cancer in our late teens and early 20s when we have our peak lifetime testosterone. The natural history of testosterone and prostate cancer contradicts the idea that high levels of testosterone are dangerous for prostate cancer. I want to thank Dr. Morgan Teller for joining me today. He's such a wealth of information, and he's going to go down in history as one of the greatest doctors and innovators of all time. A hundred years from now, when people talk about testosterone, they're going to think about Dr. Abraham Morgenthaler. Dr. Morgenthaler, if people want to find out more about you, how can they do that? Well, thank you. This is this has been a pleasure for me, and I'm so glad for your for your viewers and for the public that you took on what I think is actually one of the most important medical issues, health related issues uh, that face us today. So, thank you for the opportunity to be here. A couple of things: if people want to learn more, um, uh, uh, we have a new website that's just about to launch, um, where there's going to be my goal is for it to be the premier source for testosterone education and information. Uh, it's called uh, T4L, capital T, the number four, and the letter L, education, T4LEducation.com. Uh, I'm very proud of my two, uh, two of my books around this issue. One, uh, the most recent, is called The Truth About Men and Sex. Um, we didn't talk that much about sexuality today, but there's a chapter on my story about testosterone and finding out what was true about that and prostate cancer that I think is a great uh, story that's in that. And then Testosterone for Life is uh, my best-selling book that has been a primer for many doctors and uh, patients about how testosterone works in the body and how you treat it and measure it and follow it. So I thank you so much for having me on. And what's the best way to get your books? So Amazon.com works for just about <laughs> everything mm -hmm. and is a good source for this. Uh, I want to thank Dr. Morgan Teller for joining me today. Thank you so much for your time. You're, you're amazing. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you so much. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicell, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromicell technology. The All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner, not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEBroadcasting.com and sign up today. Since I bought Safe For You, my dad makes me clean his boat. It's natural y es un buen producto. Every time I go back to school, my mom always makes sure that I have my Safe For You products. I bring extra and my roommates certainly don't mind. It's a good thing I had Safe For You to clean up after this little guy. When my hands get dry, I like to wash them with Safe For You.
And most importantly, the reason why I buy Safe For You is because it's safe for me and you.